Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. This is a close to a record crowd, I think, like for an historical society event. Hard to top our Timothy Leary themed <laughs> event crowds, but this is Rye Um A couple things to mention um, first off before I introduce our speaker. We have recently started an email distribution list. I know we're probably 25 years behind the times on this, but we finally put it together. So I'm going to pass around this clipboard. If you would occasionally like to get emails from the Millbrook Historical Society reminding you of upcoming programs or items in the news related to Millbrook history, um, you can put your name, email address on here. Just make sure this gets back to one of us at the end there. The only other thing I'll mention really quickly is, I think I said this in the mailing that went out, which some of you probably got and some of you didn't. Last summer, we did a series of programs which we called History on Location. And I think there were six of these over the course of the summer because we hadn't really done any public programming for the first you know, year plus of the pandemic. And so we met at different locations in the village and for 20, 25 minutes, went over the history of that particular spot. We are planning on doing this again this summer. And so if you have any places in the village where you think, hey, the history of this place would be really interesting, I'd like to learn more about this. Could be a particular building, it could be a block of a street, whatever it is, uh, let us know. You know, you can talk to me or one of the other board members here. You can email us, right? Write something on Facebook, whatever. Um, let us know what you're interested in because we'd love to do this again and get people to show up for it. Um, let me introduce our, our speaker today, um, Margaret Doyle. I think of all the times that I've introduced people for events like this last few years, she probably has the most impressive resume. Um, so I'm just going to mention a couple things. Um, she has worked for the New York City Preservation Commission. She has worked for the Department of the Interior in Washington, historic preservation issues. Um, this, to me, is the most impressive aspect of her resume. Um, she was instrumental in getting historic designation for the Art Deco District down in Miami. I don't know if anyone's ever been down there, but that is a really cool place, right, where all the architecture kind of has this similar vibe. And so she's for years been involved in historic preservation, archives, and now she's working at Innisfree or volunteering at Innisfree, um, continuing this kind of lifelong goal. And so we really appreciate, we're grateful for her being here today. I'm sure you guys are as well. Um, she's going to talk for a while at the end of her talk. Um, if you have questions, you can ask them then. But let's welcome Margaret Doyle. Good evening, everyone. Uh, can you hear me in the back? Yes. A, a woman in the front said, I should have a mic, but I said I had two children, so I know how to scream. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you for coming tonight to uh, get to know Marion and Walter Beck. I started this project in September 2020, and as an historic preservationist, archiving work was, is right up my alley. The archival material at Innisfree had never been organized and wasn't in any order at all. There is much more work to do, identify, and catalog, but to date there is enough to be able to present who Marion and Walter Beck were. Here's a picture of Marion and Walter, of course with the, um, the tea house that now no longer is there uh, and it is free and you can see the gardens around them. Uh, I'm going to break the talk up into, sorry, sorry, I'm leaning on this. Uh, I'm going to break the talk up into chunks and it might seem stilted but it will mesh together. Um, I will, I'll start with Marion first. Uh, as they both had very separate lives until they were married. Marion was born in Saginaw, Michigan, which is located on Saginaw Bay in Lake Huron, 
on July 30th, 1877. Her father, Wellington R. Birch, was one of the richest men in America. He was a lumber and iron baron who owned salt mines and railroads, and he was involved in politics and finance. Her mother, Mary Amin Richardson, was his second wife. To date, I haven't much to show about Marion's early life. On November 30th, 1899, Marion Burt married George Chickering Stone, also from Saginaw, and they moved to Duluth, Minnesota, about two blocks away from Lake Superior. In either 1917 or 1919, she divorced some and began searching for a property to buy in Dutchess County. Stone settled in Pauling, New York, and on a, a place called Fairydale Farm, and then he remarried. Marion found a broker to search for a property by airplane which is pretty amazing at that time, and eventually found 950 acres surrounding the 40-acre Tyrrell Lake and bought it from Benjamin Harvey Tyrrell. There was a lake house on the east side of the lake where local residents gathered when fishing, boating, and swimming there, during a heavy snowstorm, I believe in 1963, the roof of the lake house collapsed. In the National Register nomination, the property is quoted as being set within a natural bowl wrapping around the 40-acre Lake Tyrrell. The bowl, with no other signs of human intervention visible beyond the garden, creates a profound sense of intimacy and privacy and industry. That was one of its defining characteristics. Industry, named after the 1890 poem by the great <coughs> Irish poet, William Butler Yeats, was not the first name for the property. The name Industry, which is featured in Irish passports, was preceded by Garden of the Seven Gates, and Way to the Clouds. I have yet to know where Marion and Walter met. They met in New York, of course. But they were married in New York City on August 24th, 1922. Now, um, th from that time on, they split their time between Mayfair House on 65th Street and Park Avenue and Innisfree. At first they lived in this cottage, which now is doubled in size. You can see the, the lake house. This is a bad photograph, but you can see the lake house there, and this is the cottage. <clears throat> there was a single small building to the north of the lake house, which they doubled in size and lived in until the main house was finished in 1931. They lived there with servants and guests on the lake surrounded by large fields. Now I'm going to jump to Walter. Walt, Otto Walter Beck was born in Dayton, Ohio on March 11, 1864 to Louise Schnick and Walter Charles Beck, who were both born in Germany. They had three children, Otto Walter, Louise, and Matilda. The family lived at 230 Johnston Street in Dayton, Ohio, and this building is still there, and you can see it on Zillow. So, which I did, and it's pink. It's Pepto Bismol pink. It's horrible. So, of course, here, here's uh, Otto Walker and his mother. 
I can't see which sister. I, I don't actually know which sister is which yet. It's confusing. <clears throat> so the family lived uh, uh, in Dayton, Ohio, and his father, Charles, as he was known, was the head of horticulture and design at the Dayton Soldiers' Home, established in 1867, and which today would have been a VA hospital. When Charles immigrated to the United States, he first went to Rochester, New York, which was called the Flower City. And he was there for two years, and he obtained a job at a large nursery as he had been involved in gardening in Germany. After looking into nurseries in Rochester, I have conjectured that he worked for the very successful Mount Hope Garden and Nursery for two years. And it was, it was owned by two immigrants named George Elwanger, who was German, and Patrick Barry, who was Irish. After leaving Rochester, Charles moved to Dayton, Ohio, where he obtained employment at the Dayton Soldiers' Home and took charge of the entire floral, landscape, and vegetable gardens, and supervised 75 Civil War veterans who worked full-time planning and laying out decorative areas on the ground. So this was a, the Becks were a very tight-knit family, and they really, really loved each other. And Walter, Otto Walter, was just crazy uh, about his father. This is one of his many, 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 many paintings, and it's an oil of his father. Mm. Here's Charles <clears throat> in the middle, right there. Uh, Charles in the middle of where? Sorry. Uh, with his, with his uh, surrounded by his employees. And on the back of this picture, Walter wrote in 1942, he said, the man in the center standing is my father. The men about him were his employees in the greenhouses. The, the, uh, sorry. I can't read this. I, I know this, but I can't read it. The, um, in addition, he had. In a, thank you. In addition, he had men all over the extensive grounds and the farm at the soldier's home, Dayton, Ohio. <coughs> so these are some of the decorative landscapes that were made by uh, at the Dayton soldier's home by the people who worked with and for uh, Charles. And now you can see when Walter goes to Innisfree, this whole thing is mm -hmm. genetic, I mm -hmm. think. You know, he's very interested in gardening also. <clears throat> um, <coughs> Otto, as this is this is a calendar. And this is a sundial. And I don't know if any of you have ever been to Ohio and gone to parks, but uh, I have, I've seen things where the whole name of the city is written out in marigolds in the summer. It's very elaborate. <clears throat> um, Otto, as he was known, till he married, till he married Marion, uh, when he became Walter, adored his father and spent much time with the Dayton Soldiers Home drawing convalescing Civil War soldiers. He was a prol prolific artist, often drawing on both sides of the paper, and there were many drawings and sketchy, sketches he did in the archives at industry. At the age of 22, Walter was discovered by Sarah Thresher, Mrs. J.B. Thresher, of the local uh, Dayton, the Art Society of Dayton, who sponsored him financially to attend the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Munich for a formal education. He was in Munich from 1886 
1892. So on the back of this picture it says, Sarah Thresher, my benefactress, who led me toward art and the intellectual life. And here's JB, her husband, and on the back of this Walter wrote, Mr. JB Thresher, Dayton, Ohio, who lifted me into something higher. Uh, this is a picture of Louise and Charles Beck, which I think is funny and darling. They're, they had their, their portrait done at a studio, and in the middle, they're holding up a picture of Walter. Here's Walter. Walter's away in Germany, and they, they want to make sure that people who are, saw this picture, you know, saw that Walter was in Germany. <clears throat> So I wanted to point out where Dayton is on the map in Ohio and where Cincinnati is. It's not very far, they're not very far apart. <clears throat> in 1897, he entered and won a, a national competition to paint a mural on the ceiling of the new Cincinnati City Hall. So this is 18 feet square. Uh, it is on. It's in the main entrance of City Hall, and he also did the frame, which is gilded gesso that goes around this 18 foot square mural. The mural was called the Muses. So now I'm going to talk about Caroline. Caroline was Walter's Otto, Otto Walter's first wife. So this is Caroline Peabody Perkins on her wedding day, September 3rd, 1895, to, uh, to Otto. Uh, I don't know where they met, but uh, they, Caroline lived in Brooklyn with her family. Her father, Albert Cornelius Perkins, relocated the family to Brooklyn from Massachusetts in 1883. Perk Perkins was the former head of the Phillips Exeter Academy for 10 years and went to Brooklyn to head up Adelphi College, which became Adelphi University. Uh, he had a son and a daughter, Charles Albert, and Carolyn Peabody. Charles went on to become a distinguished New York County District Attorney, prosecuting and winning many cases against corruption in New York City, and Carolyn went on to marry Otto Walter Beck. Now when, I don't know if you can see her eyes, the color of her eyes, uh, but they're, they're very, very pale blue. And in trying to identify who was who for months and months going back and forth, I had to depend on people's eye color a lot. This is a, a, a picture of them in Dayton. And uh, Charles, uh, Otto Walter is the person in the rocking chair with their friend. They moved back to Dayton for five years and then back to Brooklyn in 1900 when he began to teach at Pratt, Pratt School of Design. For the next 20 years, Otto Walter was immersed in his art and the, and the art world. He painted a series of 20 religious paintings showing the life of Christ which were originally shown at the Brooklyn Museum. This one is at the Lyle Federated Church. There are three of them at the Lyle Federated Church. A number of them are now owned by the Smithsonian Museum of Art in Washington. He did 20 portraits of the 5th New York Volunteer Infantry known as the Dorian Zouaves. 
and in 1979, the Smithsonian Museum of Art purchased Beck's Civil War portraits. The Zouaves were a unit of the army that dressed in French Moroccan soldiers' dress, uh, ballooned pants and these headdresses and little vests. And here are the Zouaves marching in, um, these are the Zouaves of 1861, marching up Fifth Avenue in 1918, what was left of them. Now I'm going to jump to John Burroughs, who was a very famous naturalist and a friend of Walters. Now he's Walter because he's married to Marion, but he knows John Burroughs. Um, this is the, the portrait he did that's over there uh, on top of the copying machine in the library here. And he did about he did five or perhaps six portraits of John Burroughs. At Innistry, what he did was he um, incised in a rock, see, a portrait of Burroughs. <coughs> oh, wow. <clears throat> and at Burroughs' home, Woodchuck Lodge in West Park, New York, there's a painting of Bex over a cabinet. This is a 1919 portrait, well, portrait of Caroline by Beck. On July 9th, 1921, Caroline died in Suffern, New York, of apoplexy, which I think is a stroke. I mean, maybe it was a catch-all phrase. I'm not sure exactly what apoplexy is was. And then they married. So I, I don't know where they met. I said that before, I think. But they were married in New York City on August 24th, 1922. <clears throat> in 1924, they made a trip to Europe where Walter had an exhibit in Rome in January of his tempera paintings. In the guest book, Mr. and Mrs. Flagler of Millbrook signed their names. They also went to the British Museum during this trip, where they were entranced with the script, with the scrolls of an 8th century Chinese landscape artist and poet named Wang Wei. And that was the beginning of their love of all things Asiatic. In the late 1920s, they hired the architecture team of Avril and Carrer to copy the Royal Horticultural Headquarters near London, called Wisley, which they had, uh, which they had finished in the early 1930s. So also in the library here, in a hanging over there, is uh, a painting by Sally Gifford on one of the um, panels. This was the aerial view of the house. And this was the front facade. And you can see the rolling lawns. This is what they originally had before the gardens were changed. Uh, they had a rolling lawn that came down to the, uh, the lake. So let me introduce you to George Leslie Stout, if you don't already know him. Uh, Walter and Marion seemed to collect people, and they had many, many friends. Among them were George Stout and Langdon Warner of Harvard's Fogg Museum of Art. George Stout, who was played by George Clooney in the film The Monuments Men, was a monuments man. He was in a, a, in a, an elite unit of the U.S. Army that was sent into Europe to uh, track down and, and get back all the artwork that the Nazis had looted. And it was mind-boggling what they took. 
Um, <coughs> so <coughs> George Stack was started out in the Navy and he developed camouflage techniques for military aircraft. Stout later became one of the first directors of the Industry Foundation, which was formed by Marion Beck and Lester Collins. Langdon Warner, an Asian art expert and archaeologist, uh, art, sorry, ar archaeologist, supposedly the role model for Indiana Jones, was also a director of the five. And both of these men were friends of Marion and Walters. The Becks visited Harvard often and must have gotten to know these two men, who were then instrumental in having the Becks of their Chinese robes and artifacts to the fog in 1942. So this is the interior of the great room in the house. And you can see there are ceramics and artifacts all over the place. <clears throat> Here on the, um, on the balcony is a Chinese man in a red hat, and all this went to Harvard. And at different times, I see different pictures of the interior, and they're staged with all this, you know, they're staged differently. And you can see that they really have so many artifacts, textile artifacts. So this is Sarah Lorson, who is the Chinese curator at the Harvard Art Museum. And she did a webinar in September of 2021. And she showed um, one of Marion's robes. And this robe is uh, a very thin <coughs> summer robe. It's, it's gauze. And um, this is a picture of Marion standing on the terrace in front of the house. Mm -hmm. Before her death in December, on December 30th in 1959, Marion Beck willed all her Chinese robes and textiles to the Harvard Art Museum. And I'm going to go through a collection of them, but it's not the entire collection. Besides being a prolific artist, Walter was also the author of many books. He was always busy writing in the margins of all his books about plans he was thinking about, and I have recently discovered boxes of a new book he started in 1953, a year before his death on September 6, 1954, and it says, to my wife, Marion Amin Birkbeck, who has inspired all my interest in garden art and has been the ideal co-worker in the making of the garden described in this book. Both Marion and Walter were cremated and laid to rest at Innistry. In 20 19, Innisfree was put onto the New York State and National Registers of Historic Places. And I leave you with one lovely picture of Walter, who at closer examination is wearing two wedding rings. <laughs> Thank you.
questions? Yeah. Anyone have questions? What happened to all the furniture in the house? Well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I haven't gotten that far. I'm really trying to dig into uh, exactly what happened to it. I think it was part of it was sold off. I mean, I know it was sold off. Uh, having the house go was a, a tragedy, yeah. you know, as many things in Millbrook have gone, you know. So I, I have yet to track down different people I think would have bought the furniture and to get that verified. Yeah. David, could you turn the lights on? Margaret? Yes? I sort of assume that there will be a second phase of this lecture. Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, I had a million pictures, and I just wanted to give you an overall uh, understanding of the Becks and what they were all about. I have, for every picture I showed you, I must have 15 other pictures that relate to that one picture. Yes. Yes? Uh, I know we could lecture for another day, but could you speak uh, to how their interest in Asian art influenced their design of the gardens? Um, I could, but not as well as I should be able to. Um, they, uh, while Walter was in Cincinnati, he attended, in 1898, he attended um, a Japanese exhibition at the Cincinnati Museum. And he met this person whose name was Ernest Fenelosa. And Fenelosa was um, a great expert on uh, Oriental art, Asian art. And he got to know Fenelosa. And that was sort of the beginning of uh, being really interested in Chinese and Japanese art. So the first day that I started with the archives, and they were all mixed up. I mean, I was doing this, and the next thing was that, and the next thing was this, and the next thing was that. Nothing, nothing meshed together. Um, I was reading about a bunch of lectures that he attended at Harvard, uh, which was on Oriental gardens and Oriental art. So they, uh, they went to... They went to abroad in 1924, and when they saw at the British Museum, they saw Wang Wei's scrolls of Oriental gardens. That was the thing that you know, started them thinking in a different direction, because they were already building a house that was um, a Queen Anne house, and it, it's pretty much uh, dictated English gardens mm -hmm. to it. But he, he, I, you know, I, don't, I haven't seen anything, but he wrote everything, everything, everything down. I haven't seen anything that, in his own words, that says what, uh, what developed into uh, the gardens that he did now. Um, Wang Wei was interested in, um, doing gardens that Walter later on calls cup gardens, which were a little, just a little garden to, of its, yeah. its own, and then it would be sort of connected to the next thing and the next thing. Um, I think Kate Karen, can, who's here, could speak to that uh, and, and make more sense out of it than I can. Yeah, no. Yes? Have you made a chronology of who was in charge of the property at different years. Yes, I started to do that. And because I was told the house was taken down because of taxes. And who owned it at that time? The, the Industry Foundation owned it. So Marion dies in 1959. She has already established the Industry Foundation, and Lester Collins becomes the president of it. And I have uh, I have two letters, where well, it's actually more than two papers where he petitions the state of New York, and I can't remember the the agency, 
he petitions them to give the Industry Foundation permission to take the house down. And uh, I think that the Industry Foundation just didn't know what to do with this huge, huge house. And therefore it went the way it went, which is terrible. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Did they have any children? No. Out of, uh, <laughs> no. Out of Walter and Carolyn had no children. Marion and George Stone had no children, and then Marion and Walter had no children. So, figure that out. I, you know, I, I don't know anything about that. Yes, but there are no children at all. Um, Marion's father was, I don't know how to put it, a little bit of a nutter or something, because he... He, he had five or six children, and early on, he wrote his will so that it said that none of his monies would be dispersed to either his children or their children until the last grandchild died, which is way into the 2000s. And because he had huge land holdings in Minnesota, the family um, went to court about it, and in the state of Minnesota, that just didn't hold up. So lots of money was freed up um, then, but the, the Wellington Burt's will is a story in itself, and, and I think you, you either have to really get down and really examine it, examine it, or be a lawyer to understand it. It's very, it's very convoluted. Um, so, um, yeah, I have Marion's will. I went to Poughkeepsie and I got Marion's will. And she had money when she died. Uh, and it's interesting to see who got the money. She was very, very generous with everybody. She was very generous with uh, people who worked for her. Um, I have been also doing oral histories with people who knew the Becks or knew the property. One person is Edie Cheryl uh, McDonald, and um, she, her, her father, Gerald, worked for the Becks and was the manager of the estate from uh, the time he was 15 <coughs> onward. And uh, they lived in the gatehouse uh, as you come into the industry. Um, for, for all of her life until she got married. Yeah. Yes? Where did, um, how, why, did she actually wear the robes or just collect them? No, I think they, maybe she did. You know, who knows? I mean, if, if I had robes, I'd put them on. You know, <laughs> big, big mirror, like I look great. Um, no, they were just, they just collected all, all, you know, they had so much money. So they just collected all this, uh, all these artifacts. Uh, the webinar I showed you about with Sarah Lorson was about uh, Asia, pe people who were the sellers of these, this material to people. And I started coming across these letters by a woman named Alice Bonnie, and I thought, like, who is she? Maybe she's their cousin. Well, it turns out that Alice Bonnie was a very uh, well-known and uh, well-known collector and dealer of Asiatic art, and they bought a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff from Alice bon Bonnie. Her, her, her name is spelled Bonnie, but it's pronounced Bonnie, so I, I have trouble with it all the time. Yes? Did they travel in Asia and buy the stuff themselves, or did they get it all from a dealer? Uh, I think some of both, don't you? I mean, they, um, I think they, when they traveled, you know, they would pick up pieces and have it shipped home. Um, but I think with people, if people know you're interested in X, uh, all the dealers in X know who you are, and they offer you the, the new, new thing. And 
you know, permit you to buy it. Yes. Who was this Lester Collins, and how did he get involved? Lester Collins, Lester Collins is a whole different story and extremely interesting. Lester Collins was a student at Harvard and got his landscape architecture degree in 1938. And he met the Becks, because the Becks were often at Harvard, and he started to collaborate with the Becks, and they just seemed to mesh. And so Lester Collins was extremely helpful in planning out what went forward after 1938 um, with the gardens. And Lester Collins, uh, who died in 1993, Lester uh, managed the Innisfree Foundation until his death, and then it was taken over by his wife, Petronella, who managed it until her, I think she, I'm not sure, I think she died in 2011, I'm not sure. Yes, so that's who the Collins were. And they came, the Collins came from Western New Jersey from a township that just had nurseries. All the Collins family were involved in nurseries and gardening and uh, that. And it turns out that his Lester Collins' grandfather had roots in Millbrook. Lester Collins' grandfather was married to Mrs. Wills. And, I can't, and she owned the Millbrook, her home turned into the Millbrook Inn. She had, she had a house here and then it turned into the Millbrook Inn. And uh, I have to go down that rabbit hole and really get some meat to put on that home. Yeah. Yeah. Forgive me if I missed this, but how did these people who were from Minnesota and Ohio Settle on Dutchess County. Well, you know, I, I I hear this story, and so far I've never. I just it's just one line, and I never was able to verify it. That somehow the the Stones, Marion Burke and George Chicker and the Stone, had some sort of a fire or something like that in Duluth. Uh, George Stone was from Saginaw. He was a very successful businessman. Um, and he was also in business in Minnesota, so I think that's why they ended up locating in Duluth. Um, and, you know, who knows? I don't know what was happening to their marriage, you know, why it started crumbling, but uh, they, I think they came east and divorced in New York. I have to get divorce records yet, and I think they divorced in New York. He went on to remarry, had three children, and um, the, you know always lived in Pauling and in New York. So he had he had money. So. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.